If you're looking to write a lease agreement but you don't quite understand all the clauses and everything that goes into it, then you've clicked on the right video. Renting a residential property may involve some risk that all parties involved should be aware of. Whenever a renting process is arranged, the most appropriate way to go is with a lease agreement. In this agreement, the landlord specifies all the terms for renting their property to that tenant. These terms should be written with the landlord's best interest in mind and in a way that they're easily understood. One critical part of any lease agreement document is understanding each clause clearly. This way, landlords can avoid misunderstandings and any legal issues with the tenant. And to make this process easier for you, in this video, I've compiled a list of all the landlord and tenant lease clause definitions that you should know before drafting a lease agreement document. Keep in mind that these lease clauses for landlords may vary depending on different state laws, the area you live in, the type of property you're renting, and many other factors. So if you have any specific doubts about drafting your lease agreement document, your best option is to talk to a trusted real estate lawyer. Also to save you time, you could download a template of a single family or a multifamily lease agreement and use the same clauses for your agreement with the link down in the description. But before we hop into these definitions, let me get some of the basic questions answered. So first, what makes a valid lease agreement. You should know your local state laws before you sign any lease agreement. This way you ensure the terms are valid and legal for all parties in that specific state. In most states, a valid lease document needs to have the following legal requirements. The type of property, contact information of all parties involved, including the information from each occupant, beginning and expiration date of the lease, the rent amount, due date, and the late fees, and holding over conditions and penalties. Next question, what are lease clauses? A lease clause is a specific specific part of a contract or rental agreement between the landlord and the tenant. These clauses need to be compliant with local state laws and other agreements between the two parties. So what types of clauses should be included? Well, there are many lease clauses for tenants and landlords that you can include in the final document. Like I've mentioned, they may vary depending on local state laws, type of property, and the area. However, there is a list of clauses that you should always consider including in the lease document, so let's get into those. First is severability clause. This one is the most important clause and you must include it in your document documents to avoid future issues with your lease. A severability clause states that if any portion of your lease is ruled non-applicable by the court, the rest of the lease agreement is going to remain valid. If you don't include a severability clause in your lease, you may be exposed to getting the entire contract invalidated by the court. An example of how you could write this would be something like, severability clause in case any provision in this lease shall be invalid, the validity of the remaining terms and conditions shall not be impaired in any way. Number two, a joint and several liability. This is another important clause that you should get into the lease if you want to make sure that you get paid when you have to. A rent liability clause states that tenants are entirely responsible for paying full rent, even if one party refuses to pay their share in a particular month. So for example, if a tenant is going to live with roommates, it's important that you hold that specific tenant liable for rent and possible damages. This way, if one roommate doesn't pay for their share of the full rent, the other tenants still need to pay the missing amount for the month. In essence, all tenants need to pay rent equally, but it's better to make sure that you always get paid in full regardless regardless of circumstances. Third is an access to premises right to entry clause. Keep in mind that by leasing your property to a tenant, you're also giving them possession of your property. However, you may still need to enter the place in case of emergency, for example, like if you see some leaking from the outside of the house. In these cases, you need to write a clause that specifies under what circumstances you can enter, how much notification you're going to give before your visit, and other things like that. Usually, you limit your visits to reasonable hours and set notifications 24 hours before your visit. These are some of the reasons you might specify the need for visiting your property. A property inspection, repairs, emergencies, or any additional services. Our fourth clause is use of premises. This term states how the tenant may use your property. You should point out any regulations or prohibitions regarding in-home businesses. Normally, the premises should only be occupied by the people listed on the document. This also involves regular maintenance activities such as cleaning, mowing the lawn, etc. The best way to ensure the tenants take care of your property is by specifying your terms on using the property. Number five is rent due date and late fees. You must specify payment conditions as clearly as possible. In this clause, you have to point out the due date for rent, the grace period for late payments, and the penalty amount that you're going to charge for your tenants for late payments. Without this clause, you might have an issue collecting late payments, so make 
make sure you go over all the details as thoroughly as possible. If you're going to include this clause with the grace period, make sure that you make it as clear as possible in the document, such as a sentence like this. The tenant shall have five days of grace to pay any late fees under this agreement. After the grace period, a default interest rate of 2% shall apply to the amount due and owing under the agreement, which shall be payable upon demand. Number six is sublet rules slash no subletting clause. You need to specify your terms for subleasing if you want to avoid issues with your tenants. If you don't want your tenants to sublet your property, you have to state this in the lease agreement. Otherwise, your tenants might sublet the premises without your permission. You could terminate the lease in this case, but you're not going to be able to penalize them for that. On the other hand, if you want to allow your property to be subleased, you may state the rules and regulations for that process on the lease agreement document, including who they're allowed to sublease to, if they need to submit a formal application to be improved, the minimum stay, such as like three months minimum. If you allow random visitors from sites like Airbnb, any security deposit you must collect from them, and a clause that they are liable for anyone else that leases under them. Number seven is renewal and holding over. Renewal clauses usually state that the tenant must give you advance written notice if they're planning to renew the lease or move out at a particular time. Tenants should specify their renewal intentions with 30 to 60 day notice. This is especially important because with that 30 to 60 day notice, you're going to have enough time to find a new tenant if they're planning on moving out. And in case that the tenant doesn't provide that advance notice, they're going to be held liable for those extra days of rent. Remember that if you don't specify renewal slash holding over conditions, the tenant only has to pay up until the end of the lease, releasing them from any extra days that they spend on your property before moving out. On the other hand, these clauses help you to collect rent legally if the tenant doesn't move out past the end of the lease listed on the rental consensus. For renewals, you can set a system to automatically renew the lease or you can draft a new lease document. Most landlords go with the option to automatically renew the agreement, but you you can choose the option you feel most comfortable with. Number eight is early termination. An early termination term states some cases in which you're allowed to terminate the rental consensus before the lease ends. Normally, these cases refer to breaches in the document's terms. This severs the relationship between the two parties, discontinuing the responsibilities stated in the agreement. An example of an early termination clause may be something like this. Early termination clause. This lease agreement may be terminated prior to its maturity date for the following reasons. Number nine, military clause lease term. Termination. This protects members and their families from any penalties that, that might occur because of active duty orders. In essence, it states that if a service member receives an active duty order before the end of the lease, they can break the agreement without paying any penalties. To properly break this lease, the service member has to show proof that they signed the lease document before engaging in active duty or permanently changing to another station. They must also prove that they intend to remain on active duty for at least 90 days. Regardless of the circumstances, the person must provide the landlord with a written notice 30 to 60 day notice. Number 10, lease termination clause. In termination clause, either party has the right to request a termination of the entire lease before its expiration. The difference between an early termination clause and the lease termination clause is that the latter shows mutual written consent between the landlords and the tenant. In contrast, the early termination clause states that the landlord may break the agreement if the tenants break any lease term. In general words, the landlord releases the tenant from any future obligations and the tenants surrender the premises. Keep in mind that the landlord may still be able to charge an extra rent amount or fee for our early termination. Number 11 is a lease breakage clause. This specifies the right for both the landlord and the tenant to terminate the lease term agreement at an agreed point in time. This ensures more flexibility for both parties if they don't want to tie themselves to a fixed contract. Even though you can use this to be more flexible with the agreement, some conditions may still be required to be met for the breakage terms to apply. The conditions might be as following. The tenant needs to be up to date with full rent amount payments. They may not have any pending late fees or additional requirements. The tenant needs to relinquish the property so that the landlord can use it. The property needs to be in good condition, otherwise the tenant shall be responsible for repairing fees. The tenant needs to give the landlord written notice about the breakage. This could be from six months up to one year of notice. Number 12 is a cleaning clause. When it comes to rental property, it's typically expected to be clean at the end of the agreement. Tenants usually need to return the unit in the exact same clean condition it was when they received it. A cleaning clause in a rental agreement refers to the tenant's responsibility for cleaning the outside of the property, common areas, and other areas. If the tenant fails to keep the property clean when the agreement ends, any cleaning clause may result in a deduction from the security deposits or charging additional rent payment. The cleaning clause may be written as follows. Cleaning clause. The tenant shall keep all areas around the property address in a clean, habitable condition, normal wear and tear expected. When the end of the rental term 
arrives, the tenant shall submit the property to further inspection. The tenant agrees to, and then put what you need in that space. <laughs> Number 13 is a security deposit clause. Security deposits are one of the most important things in any agreement for a rental unit. Both parties should agree upon the specified deposit amount before signing any documents. First, you should specify the amount of the deposit, the person who's going to hold it, and when you're going to return it to the tenants. Additionally, you have to specify how security deposits are going to be used to cover certain damage, necessary repairs, or uncollected rent. Keep in mind that if you didn't include a security deposit on the first lease, you may still add a deposit clause to a renewal process. This is also known as a lease renewal security deposit clause. Number 14 is a CPI rent increase clause. When it comes to any rental agreement, a CPI rent increase clause may have to be included to protect both parties. A CPI clause states that a landlord may tie the rent amount to the customer price index, known as the CPI. This means that the rent may have to be escalated at the beginning of every lease year according to the percentage increases in the CPI over the last year. This is done for two main reasons. One, to make sure that the premises rent can keep up with inflation rates, and two, to increase the premises market value. Number 15, painting charges clause. You should always have painting charges clause in a rental agreement. Wear and tear are common in most premises, so you must specify a way to take care of those future damages. In most cases, a landlord may deduct a repainting cost from the security deposit. This clause could be written as follows. Painting charges clause. The landlord reserves the right to determine when the premises may be painted unless any local laws state the contrary. Any painting of the premises may not be performed by the tenants without written consent. Tenants shall be held liable for repainting costs to restore the premises to their good conditions. Number 16 is a rent abatement clause. These leases work as a provision. They state that if the premises are damaged and rendered uninhabitable, the tenants may be allowed to suspend rent payments until the premises are fully restored to their normal conditions. This type of lease clause may be written according to what the landlord considers an uninhabitable environment, like fires or other natural disasters. Although the court may think otherwise if there's a legal dispute or you're trying to evict your tenant. Number 17 is an indemnification of landlord clauses. With the landlord hold harmless clause, the tenant must hold the landlord harmless from any damage or loss to the property or persons upon the leased premises. This is to protect the landlord from any damages that may have been caused by the tenants while they were occupying the premises. Now we're going to move into another section of lease clauses, the miscellaneous lease clauses. While the lease clauses I've mentioned so far are the most important ones of ensuring proper use of premises by the tenant, there are some additional personal or state-specific terms you may want to use in your agreement document. Before you get started drafting your lease clauses agreement, consider the following terms. Hopping into number 18, number of occupants. Whether you only sign one tenant or several ones, you have to state limitations regarding the number of guests that can be at the property at a particular day or time. If there are many guests continually visiting the property, you might be exposed to recurring damage, wear and tear, disturbances, etc. A particular state law might already state an occupancy standard for properties with residential purposes. However, it's always better that you state your occupancy standards alongside the state law standards. Last but not least, you have to include liability clauses in case the tenant does some damage on the property. It can be pointed out as the following. Guest clauses. The tenant is responsible for any specific actions that might damage the property and they might be held with liability for the damages even if their guests created them. Number 19, noise and disturbances. This requires the landlord to specify any restrictions or rules regarding excessive noise on their rental premises. These rules might include enforced quiet hours at certain points during the day, prohibiting parties at a particular time of the month, and banning loud music coming from the rental premises. Number 20, surrender of the premises. Aside from including a mutual agreement between the landlord and the tenant to relinquish the property at any given time, the surrender of premises clause has to state a list of moving out procedures, fees, and conditions that the tenant is responsible of. On the other hand, this clause is also required to include the security deposit return conditions. Keep in mind that surrender of premises is not the same thing as the abandonment act, which is when the tenant surrenders the property without mutual consent. Number 21, pets. You might or might not allow your tenants to have pets on your unit. Some landlords don't like letting their tenants keep a pet on the property because it can sometimes involve additional damages. If you choose to allow a pet to stay on your premise, you can charge an additional pet fee each month. This fee is intended to cover any required damages that the property may suffer. If the tenant fails to pay that additional rental fee, you can legally ask them to move the pet out of the property. You can also choose to limit the pet amount to one small animal. You should include this clause to avoid any misunderstanding between all parties involved. Number 20 
Finally two, smoking. A smoking clause in a lease is as important as any other legal rules of document. You can either completely prohibit smoking on your premises or you can designate smoking areas for the tenant. If either the tenant or guests don't follow these rules, you can use this clause to charge an additional fee or sue the tenant. Number 23, parking. Regardless of the parking spaces that your premises have, you should assign a specific spot for your tenant. If your building offers valet, also include provisions. For example, your guests are responsible for paying all valet charges. If your guests fail to pay, the charges will be added to your lease payments or taken out of the security deposit. Number 24, maintenance. Your rental unit may require frequent maintenance, for example, changing the air conditioning, HVAC filter monthly, so you have to point out these responsibilities on your lease. In some cases, the landlord may be responsible for ongoing maintenance, like an exterminator, plumbing, gardening, etc. Landlords should let tenants know in writing how to submit maintenance requests. They could submit them by phone, email, or through their online tenant portal if the landlord uses a property management software like DoorLoop. It's highly recommended to get every maintenance request in writing instead of over the phone and through the exact same channel each time, like an email, so nothing really falls through the cracks. Number 25, utilities. Paying the utilities tends to be a confusing procedure for both parties. Utility responsibilities implies clearing up who is going to pay for certain utilities on the premises. The landlord is responsible for specifying the payment methods and conditions for a shared central heating unit, water, bills, etc. Keep in mind that there are some areas with a state-specific landlord-tenant law. This means that you have to check your local law leasing conditions to make sure that you can bill your tenants for shared utilities. On the other hand, you can choose not to ask for utility payments, but if the tenant goes above a particular usage limit during the day, you can charge them the entire utility amount. And last but not least, you should include clauses that involve utility malfunction. For example, if a particular utility stops working, you may render yourself not liable for that damage. This can protect you from having to spend additional money on fixing the issue. Number 26 is force majeure clause. According to general law, a force majeure legal clause protects all parties involved from natural disasters that prevent the tenant from engaging in their contractual duties, such as paying a late fee on a particular day. Keep in mind that these natural disasters are required to be specified in the lease term document. When this event is over, the involved parties can resume their responsibilities. And last but not least, we have number 27, the lease amendment. This breaks down, can you change the lease term document after it's signed? So after both parties sign this legal document, you can only make a change to the lease if both parties agree to it in writing referred to as a lease amendment clause. You can add this language to your agreement. After the lease has expired, you can draft a lease amendment or a new term document to change as many things as you consider appropriate. And once again, to save you time, you can download our fillable lease agreement templates for single family or multifamily. And feel free to modify these and reuse anything in your own agreement. The link for those are down in the description. So in conclusion, you have to make sure that all legal terms, including miscellaneous use of premises conditions, are clearly specified throughout the document. After both parties sign the documents, they're legally bound until the contract expires or encounters a breach of terms. To have a clearer idea on how to use particular lease terms to benefit all parties involved, consult with a real estate lawyer or property manager. And a legal disclaimer, the materials and information I've talked about in this video are for informational purposes only and not for the purpose of providing legal advice. You should contact your attorney to obtain advice with respect to any particular issue, question, or problem. Ooh, okay, so so I know that was a lot of information, but if this video helped you out, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe for more useful property management and landlord content. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye!